It's a great pleasure and privilege to be able to introduce my friend and colleague, uh, James Faulkner. Also, it's a privilege to be able to participate in this activity of the Maxwell Institute, an organization that I deeply respect and uh, that I've had the privilege of associating with uh, for a number of years. <clears throat> I've known Jim Faulkner for probably over 25 years now, had the opportunity of working with him professionally in, in a scholarship that we've uh, jointly pursued. Uh, I've been able to seek his counsel in uh, my professional life, and uh, we've also been able to serve together in the church. And so it's been, it's, uh, we've had a, a very good friendship over the years, as good as two extremely introverted scholars can have. Uh, as I mentioned, we've uh, collaborated on scholarship. Uh, we've uh, published a number of things together, and uh, they're all of the sort that when they see the, the Faulkner and Williams label, they can uh, remember and know that uh, Faulkner thought it up and Williams believed it, but uh, it works well. I, uh, we should all have a friend from whom you can seek counsel, and I've sought counsel from Jim a number of times, and he's almost always been right. He has had a, a number of assignments at the university, which he has filled with distinction. He's a professor of philosophy, he's specializing in uh, modern uh, 20th and 21st century uh, continental philosophy. He served as Dean of Undergraduate Education. He has occupied the Richard L. Evans Chair of uh, Religious Understanding. And I've had the pleasure of working with him as Associate Director of the Wheatley Institution. At the present time, he's the Academic Director of the Brigham Young University London Center with uh, some responsibility for organizing conferences and lectures for the university in Great Britain and on the European continent. Jim uh, has never completely lost his roots in Missouri, and uh, it has been one of the things, I think, that's kept him tethered. He did an un his undergraduate degree at Brigham Young University and his master's and PhD in philosophy at Penn State University. He's published many professional articles and is maybe best known, and probably clearly so to this audience, for the work he's done in uh, what might be broadly called uh, gospel scholarship or Mormon studies. Uh, many of you have been introduced, first of all, to Jim's work through his uh, volume on scripture study. I know that's been very helpful to me. His uh, commentary on Romans is uh, well known and, and very well done. And uh, maybe the thing that uh, indicates a little bit of Jim's approach to things, uh, his series of scriptures made harder. He's done the Old Testament made harder, the Book of Mormon made harder, the Doctrine and Covenants made harder, and we're looking forward to the New Testament made harder. And I think that that kind of title speaks to Jim's care, his training, and his concern for truth. It's very my privilege to introduce now Professor, my friend and colleague, Professor Jim Faulkner. For most people, those titles speak also more to my perversity, perhaps, than anything else. I want to thank Richard for that kind introduction. Um, and I ought to mention that the earliest version of this paper, uh, for which, um, which, which had a, a real uh, impact on my thinking about these things, was one that we co-wrote together. I think Richard won't recognize this uh, piece that's descended from it, and he certainly doesn't have to uh, claim any responsibility for it. I want to thank the Maxwell Institute and their kind uh, offer to allow me to be here, and I too want to thank Anella for her work and the things that she's done. I want to recognize Sister Maxwell and the Maxwell family. Elder Maxwell has a, been a profound influence on many of us as an apostle, as a person of ideas, and as a human being. And it's a, with deep gratitude, I think, that we can gather here in his name today. <clears throat> 
Let me begin, though, by changing my title. I told the Maxwell Institute that I, uh, what it would be, and after I did that, I realized I'd bitten off far too much to chew in this hour. So rather than a philosophy of the family, I'm going to try to do something a little less ambitious, perhaps still uh, possible beyond what's possible except an outlined, and I'm going to offer a philosophy of marriage. Everyone has seen one or two uh, television version of the Frankenstein story. The first was made in 1910, and there have been many since. This Boris Karloff version of the Frankenstein monster has become iconic. Perhaps some have also read Mary Wollstonecraft Godwin Shelley's 1818 novel, Frankenstein, or the modern Prometheus, from which those films are adapted. And in the book, we find an Arctic explorer, Robert Walton, uh, who, while stuck in the ice, uh, trying to get to the North Pole, finds Victor Frankenstein traveling by sledge and takes him aboard ship. There Frankenstein tells his story as a student overcome with a passion to know the secret of life. Frankenstein creates a human body from various unrelated body parts and ultimately he uses electricity to bring it to life, the modern scientific fire. In horror, Frankenstein flees when he sees what he has done. Now, as you already know, if you know the story at all, and even the first reader could have guessed at that point, things do not go well after this. The monster murders Victor's younger brother in a fit of rage at having been created as a lone being, a new but monstrous Adam for whom there is no Eve. He persuades Frankenstein to create a bride to repair his loneliness, but midway through the project, Frankenstein again becomes horrified at what he's doing and destroys the potential second creation. In revenge, the monster kills one of Frankenstein's friends and on his wedding night, kills Elizabeth, his bride and childhood friend. When the explorer Walton discovers the monster's creator, uh, he has been searching for that monster to, to try to destroy him. Frankenstein dies shortly after uh, Walton discovers him and Walton discovers uh, that the monster is crying over his body. Then he wanders off into the ice, into the Arctic to die. The films are proof of the emotional and intellectual draw of this story. It isn't just a horror story. It's a story about us and our relationships, a story about humanity gone wrong. In Shelley's novel, the Frankenstein story is like a photographic negative. It is the reversed image of the story of human creation in Genesis. In it, she shows us what modern individualism means. In Genesis, God, unlike Frankenstein, saw man in the garden and recognized that it was not good, it says absolutely not good in the Hebrew, for man to be alone. As merely an individual and merely male, the being created was not yet fully human, so God created woman. And the narrator of Genesis emphasizes that as a couple, these two were not merely individuals, they were to be one flesh. In the Bible, human being is multiple rather than individual, to be human is to be in relationship. So tonight I want to try to do two things. <clears throat> First, I want to show you how modern Western culture is like Victor Frankenstein. It's, vic it's individualistic. It believes that life is a matter of bits and pieces put together. But Frankenstein discovered that he was wrong. Bits and pieces don't make a real human being. And that brings me to my second point, that real human being is necessary in relation to others. I will use several contemporary thinkers to show how relation with, with others can be conceived. And though I will use them to argue that we are, we are who we are only in relationship with other people, I will go further to argue that the marriage relationship is the paradigm for all human relationships. So let me start by talking about the modern individual. We find a sea change in Western culture happened in the 16th and 17th centuries when modernism began. And that's been a very good thing. It's given us science and technology, and without them, many of us in this room tonight would not be here, having died young of disease. Without them, we, are, we would be much less comfortable than we are here. We are able to do many things more efficiently, in fact, able to do many more things because of what modernism has bequeathed us. But it's not been an unalloyed good. With the good, it also brought difficulties most of which we don't recognize because they've become so seemingly natural to us, we breathe modernism's air without knowing it. So we do not notice that some of what it contains is not good for us. 
But for the last 20 years or more, philosophers have thought about the problems of modernism. And one of those problems is that in modern culture, it's difficult for us to give a rational, philosophical thought account of marriage. <clears throat> that wasn't true prior to modernism. Ancient and medieval thinkers had philosophical resources for understanding marriage. But the further we go into the modern period, the more the philosophical norm is an atomistic individualism. And that individualism has made it difficult for marriage to be philosophically intelligible. If we think of individuals as the building blocks from which relationships of any kind are formed, as atoms, we can ask what it means that some individuals came together in marriage and then created a family. What are the ties that bind marriages and families? Since modernism assumes that individuals are the atoms from which any social order is created, our answer would ultimately have to be given in terms only of individuals. But that means that marriage would be a relationship constructed, <clears throat> excuse me, more or less by accident, with no real being of its own, except the kind of being that one finds in a contract. But all of us who are married know that marriage is always more than a contract. It isn't just I and Janice who make our marriage by, by some decision to, to come together as husband and wife. Being married has also made each of us. The same more obviously goes for the family. It cannot be reduced to decisions made by individuals as important as those in decisions may be. Marital and family ties are real and they have real effects. So how can we account for marriage intellectually? My argument is that several late 20th and early 20th first century thinkers have given us some alternatives that make a philosophy of marriage conceivable, though tonight I will be able only to give an outline of the argument that I make by using those thinkers. Seeing how recent philosophy understands relations between persons differently than modernism does will require that I do a little bit of uh, history of philosophy. And of course, since we are here for a relatively short time, and I hope you don't think of it as too long a time, I will have to ignore the nuances and the exceptions that make history interesting and complicated. So with that, uh, that caveat about history, <clears throat> Let me point out that as in, in, in Western philosophy, as always, we begin with the Greeks. We can reasonably uh, say that beginning with them and continuing through the late medieval period, the dominant way of thinking about persons was to see the individual as an aspect of an ordered cosmos. That didn't just mean seeing them as one entity surrounded by others in a universe of things. It meant seeing them as a part of a unity that is inherently ordered and beautiful at every level, social and physical. In a mosaic, the whole is, is beautiful because each of its parts is in the right place. And each of the individual tiles has its significance in the mosaic because it occupies the place that it does. Ancient Greeks and others thought of the universe like that. Each thing, including each person, had a place. To the degree that any particular thing or person lived up to what it was, it fit in the universe like a tile in a beautiful mosaic. Thus, the person's project as a human being was one of accommodating herself to the cosmic order, fitting herself into the beautiful whole. Since that cosmic order manifests itself not only in the physical, but also in the social world, ethics meant understanding how to fit in with one's community and family. In Aristotle, for example, the highest being is what he calls the theos. We translate that word as God, but Aristotle certainly didn't have in mind anything like what we think of as God. For him, the theos was the purely intellectual being toward which all thought and action is directed in the long run. Ultimately, everything in the cosmos needed to be understood in terms of its relationship to the theos. Within that way of thinking, the person was understood in terms of his or her relationship to other persons, first the family, then the larger community, finally the theos. Now, not everyone in ancient uh, thought was an Aristotelian, but his view is a good example of what an ancient ethical view could look like. However the, ancient understanding of ethics was among the, however, the ancient understanding of ethics was among the things that changed rapidly and dramatically around the 16th century. As modernism developed, Western thinkers began to, sunder, to surrender the early view of the cosmos as an ordered whole, and with it they gave up the notion uh, that individual people were primarily defined in relationship to that whole. For ancients and medievals, the individual was an aspect of the whole, perhaps an essential one, but the individual could not be understood apart from it. Modernism, however, reversed things. Instead of seeing the individual in light of the whole, modernism understood the whole atomistically. 
The individual is a part from which something else can be conceived. <coughs> Excuse me, constructed. Persons are the basic social atoms, and the whole results from those being put together. But this reversal turns out to be monstrous as it was for Victor Frankenstein. Prometheus stole fire from the gods as a gift to humans, a gift to make human life fully possible. But by starting with only bits and pieces and no, and no attention to the whole of which they were a part, Frankenstein used the fire of electricity to give only regret, menace, and death rather than life. We will see that as a result of this shift in understanding that came with modernism, it became philosophically impossible to give an adequate ad account of how relationships between human beings themselves as well as relations between human beings and the world are possible. Having broken the connections between persons, philosophy had no conceptual tools by which it could reestablish them. <clears throat> For almost 100 years, the 17th century French thinker, René Descartes, has been the whipping boy when discussing this and other problems of modern thought. Now, I recognize uh, quite clearly that Descartes' work is more nuanced than those discussions usually portray it. Nevertheless, he so well characterizes the issues that I will deal with that I too will use him as a whipping boy. We can see many of the problems of modernism by thinking about issues in Descartes' philosophy. Every college freshman knows Descartes' proposition, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. You find it on mugs, t-shirts, all over the place. It's one of the things that beginning philosophy students like to argue about. Descartes was an important mathematician and scientist as well as a philosopher. He developed the first analytic geometry, making calculus possible. And he believed that all true knowledge could be tested using the method of geometric proof. Proofs were part of Descartes' overall method, which he called the method of doubt. Now, that doesn't mean that he genuinely doubted everything. Rather, he used doubt as a way of finding the truth. His method was first doubt everything and then use these geometric style proofs to see what can withstand your doubts. What cannot be doubted because it can be proven is knowledge. Now, how does one prove what cannot be doubted? By beginning with an indubitable axiom, a basic undeniable proposition, and building on that in steps that are also undeniable. For Descartes, the proposition I think, therefore I am was the axiom on which he could base all other knowledge. His point was that the proposition is axiomatic because I know I exist simply by the fact that I am thinking. I cannot think that I do not exist without contradicting myself. Thus, my certainty of self is fundamental. And the next question then comes up, well, what else do I know certainly based on that axiom? <clears throat> Unfortunately for Descartes, the answer is unclear because the rest of his work uh, uh, to, to, which, which was supposed to show us how we know the world, depended on his proof that God exists, his axiomatic proof. But few believe that his proof works, and that means the project as, to establish knowledge on irrefutable grounds fails. If we follow Descartes, I know I exist, but I do not know about anything outside my own mind. Now that philosophical problem has a variety of answers, perhaps most notably that of the German thinker Immanuel Kant in the 18th century. But those answers don't concern me directly tonight. I'm more interested in the problems that Descartes' understanding of the self created. Until relatively recently, few have thought about how, in spite of the problems with Descartes' project, the Cartesian ego, sure of itself and nothing else, has insinuated itself into so many nooks and crannies of Western thought. We very often think about the, Persian as, the person as a Cartesian ego without knowing that we are doing that and without thinking about the consequences of doing so. With regard to marriage, however, that insinuation should be obvious. How can a Cartesian ego be related to another Cartesian ego at all, much less be part of a human family, except perhaps by an act of will? The first problem with the ego is its solitude. If we begin with a Cartesian ego, then we cannot explain how it's possible to recognize the existence of another person with a mind like mine, an ego that also says, I think, therefore I am. We can know our mental representations of other persons. I'm having the experience here and now of seeing and hearing people in front of me. So I know I'm having that experience. But that says something about my mental experience, not about whether there really are people out there in the audience. Now I'm hoping you're actually there. 
But according to Descartes, I can't know that you are. Obviously, I know that there are other people, though. So how do I know that? Perhaps we know other minds by analogy. I'm a person, and this thing that appears in my representations of the world has many of the characteristics that I have, so I assume it's also a person. But if I understand the other person by analogy, then I'm still talking about my mental representations. I'm not talking about the persons themselves. It seems that I cannot know them. I cannot know other people themselves. Now, Kant later argued convincingly that Cartesian metaphysics and its heirs don't allow us to know any things by themselves, in themselves. Neither mere objects, nor other persons, nor, it turns out, even ourselves. Now, my argument is that Kant was right about Cartesianism. But in spite of that, it is possible to know both others and objects as they are. A second problem for the Cartesian ego is that Descartes uh, relates the solitary ego to the world through the passions. He separates the mind, or the soul, which he, are, are synonyms for him. He separates that mind or soul from the body. He says they are radically distinct. The difficulty of knowing the world arises because of that radical distinction. Since the world and the body are material, and the mind or the soul is not, the connection of mind and the world is tenuous at best. For the mind can know itself, but it's not clear how it can know something so different from itself as the material world. As a result, Descartes understands the passions only in terms of the mind. They are a kind of thought, though he says it's confused thought. And those who have been under certain passions will understand why he thinks it's confused. The passions are mental representations, even if they arise from the influence of external events. This second problem, namely his identification of the passions with the mind, means that whether we're talking about erotic, family, or friendly love, all love is a form of self-love. For Descartes, self-love is the foundation for all emotions, even something like anger. He tell, even something like anger, he tells us, is desire in combination with self-love. And this claim that all our passions are manifestations of self-love is a relatively novel position in the history of thought prior to him. But it has become a common assumption. It's not difficult to see the origin of much contemporary pop psychology in this Cartesian assumption. In any case, by looking at Descartes, we can see that in modernism, the atomistic individual is at the center of not only the physical world, but the social and emotional one. If Descartes is right that love is a matter of will and representation, then the Cartesian ego wills to love its beloved, but what it loves is just a picture of that beloved rather than the beloved itself, because that's all the ego knows. For Descartes and other early modern philosophers, then, good means what I want. And he's willing to recognize the extremes to which that take us, takes us. At best, human lo uh, love relations amount to only self-gratification, my involvement with images in my mind. At worst, they amount to rape, marital relations, <clears throat> and the family love. And the family can be no more than one more sphere in which the ego wreaks its will on what it represents. This claim that love is a matter of will and that the beloved is necessarily no more than an object of representation is quite shocking. Without taking the time for the whys and wherefores, I note that Descartes is quite explicit about this shock. He says that this understanding of love means that vainglory, greed, I'm quoting here, wine bibbing, rape, marital love, and parental love are all essentially the same. Presumably all that separates these forms of love from one another are norms of society, mere convention. It's no exaggeration to say that something like this Cartesian view of ethics and marriage invisibly undergirds most modern attempts to understand ourselves. But the real invisibility of this Cartesian view does not mean that it is not there or that it does not have real effects. The common attempts to reduce our understandings of relations of husbands and wives to personal satisfaction is but one of such attempts. Their overall effect is that from a modern point of view, marriage is a sphere of will enacted on our representations and nothing more. So let me recapitulate. In Descartes, the atomistic individualism of modernism makes itself apparent. It separates the person from the world and from all others. Since Descartes' proof of God's existence fails, the Cartesian individual is even separated from God. In that separation of the self from everything else, the earlier notion of the person who is part of the ordered whole becomes the modern notion of the independent individual 
that which exists on its own. The person is sundered from the whole, from its place in this ordered cosmos. Indeed, the cosmos is no longer ordered. All is primal chaos, and the spirit of God no longer hovers over it. Adrift in an ethically chaotic universe, the good can be no more than the object of any man's appetite or desire, as the 17th century English philosopher Thomas Hobbes describes it. If the ego, the I, is the foundation for our understanding of ourselves and the world, then in principle that ego is cut off from every other person as such. The only possible relationship of the individual ego to another person is representation, but that means that any, re represent, any relationship with another person is only a relation between the ego and itself in its images, rather than a relation to the other person herself. The solitary ego makes real love of someone other than oneself impossible. <clears throat> of course, Descartes was not the only philosopher of modernism, and there's been additional thought about these things in the last 400 years. But as true as that is, it is also true that Descartes shows us, in outline, the strong tendencies of modern thought, and those outlines and tendencies continue to haunt the ways in which we experience and understand the world, often in spite of ourselves, usually without us knowing. We cannot escape the spectral presence of individualism so clearly modeled in Descartes' thinking or the effects of that individualism, even though they are often invisible. One of those effects is in the ways we think about our relationships with other people. For about 200 years, the most influential version of ethics has probably been utilitarianism. And in that way of thinking, the term good is defined as doing whatever will maximize my or our desires and pleasures as much as reasonably possible. Given the individualistic metaphysics of modernism, perhaps no better ethics is possible, as unsatisfactory as that view of the world founded on self-love may be because it has little or no room for things such as oath, covenant, or obligation. So let me turn to a contemporary alternative and try to talk about that more than we talk about the problems. My argument is that we find an answer to the problem of human relationships by rethinking ethics. We saw earlier that a version of my answer has been with us for millennia. Prior to modernism, ethics had been part of the larger project of ontology. The ultimate good was the attainment of completeness within and with the whole. The Greek word ethos means one's accustomed place. And the question of ethics was, what is our place in the cosmos, and what does that require of us? Ethics meant more than morality, though morality was certainly included. Just after the middle of the 20th century, a French-Lithuanian philosopher, Emmanuel Levinas, responded to the morally rudderless universe that I have just described by approaching it in a manner that reflected but did not duplicate the ancient approach to the question of human relationships. Levinas was hardly the first to do so but he took a radically different approach than others by arguing that the basic assumptions of modern thought concerning the relationships between people are mistaken. Levinas argued that in a world in which human beings are essentially independent from one another, meaning is impossible. Even Frankenstein's monster is in relation with someone else, at least Victor, and his life is defined by that relationship. He cannot get away from it. Levinas says that if an individual, a being more monstrous than that created by Frankenstein, were in principle independent of all other people, thought would strike nothing substantial. In other words, if I were truly independent in that way, then there would be nothing for me to think about because there would be nothing to bridge the gap between me and other things. But we are not these monsters cut off from all else and turned in only on ourselves. We do have meaning. So there must be things other than myself, and there must be that which makes that relationship possible. Now, the last, my last point is important, for it means that not only must there be something out there about which I can think, there must also be someone to whom I can communicate, and a language through which things that surround me in the world acquire being. In other words, acquire stability as a this or a that. We can deal with the various things in the world, distinguishing one from the other, and manipulating them as we do because we have language that names them and allows us to put them in relation to other things. Language in its broadest and deepest sense gathers the world into a whole and allows us to live comfortably in that world. And we have language because we are in expressive relationships with other persons. The monster knew the world because he had language and he had language because presumably Frankenstein taught him. But language is neither mine nor yours. <clears throat> it is necessarily ours. 
and it comes before any one of us, always given to us by someone else. The idea of a fundamentally acosmic individual having meaning and thoughts is incoherent. To quote uh, Levinas, it is necessary already to be for the other person, for the phenomenon of meaning to arise. The meanings I have, including the meaning of myself, presuppose that I'm already in relationship with someone else, someone who's made those meanings possible. In spite of that, given the powerful and pervasive role of language and knowledge and meaning, at first glance it seems that language traps us in our own representation and symbol systems and that we have no way out of them. I can know what I think, I can reflect on what I know, but it appears that I cannot get beyond language and ideas to anything outside my mind. I can agree that the other person comes before us because you say so, but it seems that I cannot connect my mind to that other person herself. To quote Jacques Derrida's much misinterpreted and very often abused phrase, it appears that there's nothing outside the text. But that problem of being trapped in language, a variation on the problem of Cartesianism, is only apparent, and that's true for both Levinas and Derrida. That is because, says Levinas, society with the other person is not constituted as the work of an I giving meaning. Modern individualism assumes that I'm the one who gives meaning in my relationships with others, but that assumption is false. My relationship with the other person comes from that other person, not from me. The language I have was given to me by another. I did not invent it. I must already be in contact with the other person if I can receive the language that she offers me. Now stop for a moment to step back and think about the implications of this point <coughs> Uh, the point that language and, relation and meaning come from the other person rather than from me. Notice that in this view, passivity, receptivity, being affected, rather than will or representation is at the heart of the human relationship to the other person and the world. This is perhaps the most decisive difference between much of contemporary thought and thinkers like Hobbes and Descartes. For most modern thinkers, and modern for philosophers means, say, prior to 1900, for most modern thinkers, the fundamental characteristic of human being is will. But Levinas and others argues that it's receptivity, which necessarily implies relationship. Of course, human beings can will and act, but we do not understand the possibility of meaning if we reduce our relationship to the world to that ability, ignoring our capacity to be acted upon to receive. I do not know the world only because I have touched it in some way, perhaps with my mind, I am not related to other persons because I create those relationships. I know the world and other people because they first touch me. There is no question that the things I encounter in the world are only what they are. Particular things like this podium, uh, your rather uncomfortable chairs, rather than an amorphous haze of raw sense experience, if they are ordered by the categories and relations of thought and language. But I have those categories and relations of thought and language only because I've been touched, as it were, by another person. The meaning of the world is given to me by others. We can say, then, that experience is a double passivity, a doubled receptivity of embodiment. For I am touched by the world in sensation and touched by the other person in thought and language. That double passivity is the first fact for understanding my being in the world. Relationships with other persons come before meaning, and they're made possible by the touch of the world and the touch of the other person. That touch happens prior to the work of the ego's will and the mind's representations. I am not trapped inside my language or my mental representations because both of them are the result of relationships with other humans and relations with things. Rather than what keep me locked inside myself, language and thought are what connect me to the world. My argument, though abbreviated, is that this priority of ethics, in other words, of human relationships, and the double passivity of touch means that human relationships of every kind, kind can best be understood from the paradigm of marriage and that marriage cannot be understood apart from oath. Against this background of uh, passivity, understanding a human being in terms of passivity, Levinas' startling claim is that the erotic relation, which is the fundamental form of human relationship, gives rise to meaning. For, for Levinas, the fundamental relationship with other people is erotic, but he's not using that term in the narrow sense of only sexual desire. Instead, like Plato, he uses the term to mean desire for anything that is beautiful and good, and particularly the beautiful and the good as they show themselves in another person. When I'm in a relationship with another person and I'm, and I'm attracted to her beauty and goodness, I'm in an erotic relationship 
whether or not that is sexual. As with all relationships, in Eros we find ourselves beyond ourselves, in a relationship that comes before meaning rather than being reducible to representation, as it is in pornography, or being beyond meaning, whereas in naive romanticism it is reduced merely to mystery. Both the world and other persons are necessary to our experience, and we have experience because both are outside our minds. But our relationship with other persons is not like our relationship to things. A loving caress is different than other kinds of touch, a radically different and radically different than any grasp or attempt to gain possession or control. For more than 70 years, philosophers have been writing about the caress. You will not be surprised that most of those doing so have been French. <laughs> Perhaps one of the first was Jean-Paul Sartre, the existentialist thinker who said, and I'm quoting here, Caresses are an appropriation of the other person. The caress is not a simple touch, it is a shaping. In caressing the other person, I make her flesh come to life under my fingers. For Sartre, the caress in any form is indistinguishable from the grooming of the pedophile. But he is wrong, for he fails to recognize that a caress is not a directed act in which we take up an object in order to perform some task. It involves neither object nor task. I reach out for a hammer in order to pound a nail. I want to build something, to reach a goal. But when I caress my beloved, I am not achieving a purpose. In the caress, neither my hand nor the caress is a tool. It is not part of a structure of means and ends. It's also not an act of cognition. The I who caresses the beloved is not a cognizing thing. The lover is neither a Cartesian thinking thing nor a Sartrean sadomasochist. Touched by the beauty and goodness of the other person, the lover responds with a touch of a caress. Strictly speaking, the caress itself is not meaningful because it does not represent anything. It comes before meaning in the relationship, but it is a response of one person to another. In the erotic touch, a lover addresses himself or herself directly to the other person rather than to the idea of the other person or to the feelings that one has about the other. If I strike my thumb with a hammer, I cry out. But that cry is not yet about something. I'm not yet making a statement, not even the statement that hurt. The cry is a response to one's relationship with things in the world, a precognitive expression of that relationship. Similarly, the cries and caresses of love are not about something. They are the acts of love rather than its content. Though without content, they address the loved one. It is significant that we say one makes rather than that one means love. Though the caresses have no conceptual or linguistic content, they are expressive in that they, like the cry of pain, speak something. They speak the effect of the beloved on the lover, the precognitive relationship between the two. As an expression of that relationship with another person, the caress shows the basis for the possibility of meaning. Direct expressive contact with someone other than oneself is the ground from which meaning grows. Because Descartes' atomistic eye insists on beginning with self-certainty, knowledge of itself, it can find nothing, neither a person nor a thing, outside of or prior to itself. The only meaning it has is the empty I think. But even Frankenstein's monster could do better than that. Analysis of the caress shows that meaning is possible because two things are prior to the individual ego. There is, first of all, the caressing person, the acted upon and acting me, rather than the, than the cogitizing I. The caressing person is not related to the idea of the beloved by the caress, but to the beloved herself. That relationship is a relation of embodied touch, not thought, though it does make cognition possible. Now, I will use the word flesh to speak of this body in order to differentiate it from the body as a merely material object. And by flesh, I mean that which experiences, suffers, and enjoys. It is material, but it's more than that. In the caress, we see that flesh and its life in the world among things and with others comes before reflective thought. And the second thing that comes before the individual ego and makes meaning possible is the beloved. Together, this touched and touching flesh and the other person in the relationship give the self a me. I get an identity. I am the one in this relationship. But the me in this relationship is more than the Cartesian I that knows itself. I'm not only a mind related to the world and others, in that I am affected by another whose beauty and goodness I desire and whom I caress, I'm a body of flesh. The I which cognizes has come about as an aspect of my flesh and it's being affected. 
The Cartesian ego is as, not as fundamental to my being as modernism would have us believe, but the living body is. The fact that cognition is founded upon our being affected on ethical relationship means that my experience of the other person as person is always what the contemporary thinker Jean-Luc Marion calls a saturated phenomenon. That term isn't as mysterious as it might first seem, for it means a phenomenon that's not reducible to its representational or conceptual content. Examples are easy to come by. I stand at the top of Squaw Peak looking out over Utah Valley, and I am in awe. I turn the corner in the Museum of Art to see a painting I've never seen before, and I'm overcome. I sit by Janice, and I'm suddenly overcome by emotion, a feeling of gratitude for grace as much as anything else. These are all experiences of saturated phenomena, experiences in which there is more in what I'm experiencing than can be contained by any concept I might form in response to that event. The phenomenon of the other person whom I desire is always such an experience. It overflows any concept I have of her because there is more intuition in the experience than can be brought into the concept. But before going on, I need to define intuition. It's a word that philosophers use differently than anyone else. Not, you shouldn't be surprised at that. But as used here, intuition is the immediate apprehension of something by the senses. In this case that we're talking about, it is the experience of what Williams James described as the great blooming buzzing confusion of sense perception by itself without the ordering provided by cognition. And intuition doesn't necessarily cause someone to have a thought, but it does give that person an experience. As a product of being affected by other things, or as, in fact, the being affected by other things, rather than a product of cognition, the intuition of the other person saturates my experience of her so that I cannot have an adequate concept of her. But not only is the other person whom I encounter more than I can think, I, myself, as a living whole rather than a cogitizing ego, am more than I can think. I, too, am a saturated phenomenon because I, too, am the product of being affected. There are saturated phenomena they, uh, because I am not trapped inside my, my Cartesian, I think, in its language. It would seem that this makes objectivity impossible, or at least not particularly important. It's tempting to think about saturated phenomena and wish that life were a never-ending experience of them. But like Alma, when we wish to escape from the ordinariness of life, we do sin in our wish. Though, objectivity, though objective certainty requires impoverished rather than saturated intuition, it does not follow that objectivity is a bad thing. Indeed, it is essential. Without ordinary life and the objectivity that it requires, we would not be able to deal with our world effectively. Objective knowledge and certainty are tools we use to deal with James' blooming, buzzing, confusing of world as we impose order on that world. Nevertheless, what I can be objectively certain of when it comes to either myself or the other person is exactly the same as what I could be objectively certain of when it comes to any object. It is a representation. Certainty is a function of objectivity, and objectivity is only possible where we do not have a saturated intuition, but one in which the concept is adequate to the intuition. Now, in fact, we live in a world that exists prior to our conceptual organization. We do have experiences of its blooming and buzzing. We can talk about our experience of things in themselves, experiences that occur in saturated phenomena, or we can talk about our experience of cognition and representation. The two are inseparably linked. In spite of that link, however, we make a category mistake if we use the methods and terms appropriate to one kind of experience to talk about the other. Looking for objective certainty regarding saturated phenomena would be such a mistake. The terms certain and uncertain simply don't apply, and this is true whether we're talking about loving relationships or about religious or aesthetic experience. As I've already pointed out, experiences of saturated phenomena are not unusual. To say that a phenomenon is saturated is to imply that objective knowledge is not adequate to it, but that doesn't mean that it's not a genuine phenomenon or that the thing we encounter in that phenomenon isn't real. The experience of a saturated phenomenon is not merely subjective. These experiences fall outside the subjective-objective dichotomy. It's also important to remember that being more than what can be represented is not the same thing as being non-phenomenal, utterly unknowable, or not representable at all. Not all knowledge is certain knowledge, as biblical writers who without euphemism speak of conjugal relations as knowledge have understood for millennia. What we learn in the experience of saturated phenomena is knowledge. It's another kind of genuine knowledge. Since the real embodied and living self is a saturated phenomenon, Descartes' mistake 
was to reduce self-knowledge to self-certainty. He confused the part of the self that says, I know, with the saturated self, which exceeds the conceptual grasp of that knowing ego. That reduction of the self to ego is philosophically debilitating. As a Cartesian ego, I can have certainty that I am insofar as and in the instant when I think I am. I may always be implicitly thinking in that in some sense, I, thinking anything at all, may carry with it the implicit thought, well, I'm the one thinking this. But be that as it may, self-certainty is always only a matter of the present instant. I am means I am right now. It carries no future guarantee. As a Cartesian ego, I can be certain of my present, I know I am right now, but I cannot know my future. The problem is that I want a future. In fact, I not only desire to continue to exist in the future, but even more, I desire to have value. I want to know that my continued existence is worth something. I want an answer to the question, is my existence in vain? What's the point? And the merely Cartesian ego cannot but suspect that the answer to his question is nothing. Frankenstein's individualistic monster can say, I am, but he cannot say there is a reason for my continued existence because the tragedy of his creation is that there is no such reason. If we understand a person to be an isolated atomi atomic Cartesian ego looking for certainty, then it seems that nothing can resist vanity. Even what I know with certainty exists may exist in vain. So to the question, what's the point? Implicitly, Descartes and his heirs, like the preacher of Ecclesiastes, answers, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. There is certainty only within the horizon of my present consciousness. I can always doubt the past or the future because they cannot be certain. So as an I am, I am only too aware of my human finitude. I am always capable of doubting the value and meaning of that humanity. But I want assurance, assurance that my life is not in vain and that I can have value and meaning. For me to have value requires that I can be other than I am. If my beloved cannot but love me, if it's certain that she must, and I her, then it makes little sense to say that I am loved and love. To desire a future, value and meaning is therefore to live in a world of possibility rather than certainty. A world of possibility is incompatible with a world of absolute certainty. How then is assurance of future value possible? Ultimately, whether I can be freed from vanity comes down to the question of whether anyone loves me. A question about physical and social relations as much or more than about psychological states. That's because I can determine on my own the answer to the question, do I exist? But I cannot answer the question, what's the point, by myself. Only another person can answer that question of whether my life is in vain, and the other person answers that question by loving me. But the person revealed in Eros is not the Cartesian eye, for that's an ego that masters, and the person in an erotic relation is, as it were, mastered. The me of Eros is revealed by someone other than myself. The Cartesian eye wants to create knowledge and certainty but a person doesn't create his or her own value, we receive our value from others. First comes love, which gives me value and knowledge of that value, though not certainty of it. Only on that foundation is certainty possible, a foundation in which I'm touched by things and given language by others. Certainty is made possible by love, not the reverse. Since the phenomenon of love is relational, it has two aspects, the lover and the beloved. I can, and because of that, I cannot by myself make it happen. A love relationship cannot be counted simply as one of my acts, nor is it merely something that happens to me. Love defies the simple categories of passive and active, yet it is something real that occurs between two persons. We could use Cartesian terms to describe an ordinary phenomenon. I say I am, and then I say I have a mental representation of this thing before me, but the lover does not say I am at all. If we speak of the caress in terms of language, we must say that instead of I am, the lover, like the biblical prophets responding to God, says to the beloved, here I am, behold me here. Obviously, here I am signifies more than the spatial relationship of the lover. Such an announcement is a welcome. It says, please be my guest, or even the more prosaic, at your service. But however prosaic our welcome circumstances, and it must often be prosaic, here I am is also an oath, an oath to continue to be in this relationship, the acts of love are performative. They do not say what they describe, they make what they say. The acts of love make the oath of love and they do so above and beyond the psychological state of the individuals who love. Without contradicting myself, I cannot say I love you now, but not later. To say I love you is to say I love you now and in the future. 
If I'm in a relationship of love with another, then I have made an oath to continue in that relationship. I have promised to continue to say, here I am. My assurance of, of a future is found in that oath. The guarantee that the erotic phenomenon can continue comes in my faithfulness to the oath of love. That faithfulness overcomes vanity by extending love into the future beyond the ken of any mere Cartesian eye. What is the temporality of the erotic phenomenon? It's the extension into the future of faithfulness rather than the moment in time of certainty. And the figure of erotic temporality is eternity rather than mere time, since the oath of love cannot envision an end. As we all know, the intimacy of love is not something created by a single consciousness. More than once as a young man, I fell in love, supposedly. I was enchanted by a young woman. It seemed that I thought about her all the time. I was flummoxed and my heart beat in her presence. I wanted to write poetry, and I'm embarrassed to say I actually did once or twice. But merely having that emotional experience didn't mean that I was in love. I couldn't create love merely by feeling it or representing it to myself or representing her to me. <clears throat> I couldn't be in love merely by making her the object of my affection. Because in most cases, my interest in that person was probably not even known, much less returned. The relationship was not love. If I was in love at all, it was with representations of a woman, not the woman herself. It was love of myself. But love requires two beings of living flesh, not just one mind. That the event of love requires two persons means that the oath and future which the intimacy of love creates cannot be destroyed by the act of a single consciousness. The oath came about in a relationship to another, not merely as something done by oneself. So if a lover denies his love and ceases to be faithful, it does not follow that the oath has been erased. To deny or try to destroy one's oath as an act of individual will is to be violent, it is to violate the person of the one to whom one has made the oath, as well as one's own person. And that's because the value of the violator's future came about in the relationship created by the oath. But someone may object. What are we to make of the uncertainty of love? It takes very little reflection to remember that I cannot guarantee the faithfulness of my beloved. I cannot be certain that someone will continue to love me. The love occurs only in a relationship. Ultimately, I must be the one who responds to the question, does anyone love me? Faced with uncertainty, I gain the assurance I sought by continuing to be faithful to the oath that I made in our relationship. Though the other person has made the oath possible, ultimately my value comes not from her, but from the oath and the possibility of being faithful to it, which are only possible because of her. Faithfulness opens the future that makes value possible. The eye seeks assurance that not everything is vanity. That assurance comes neither in certainty nor in the continued love of my beloved. It comes in my faithfulness to the oath I have made, rather than in the beloved's faithfulness to me. I am a lover only to the degree that I make my oath and expose myself to the other person and the uncertainty explicit in that exposure. Rather than certainty, the assurance of love is what is bequeathed by faithfulness to uncertainty. In other words, by faithfulness to the future. For if the future were certain, it would not be a future. Instead, it would be a not yet revealed present. It would be the way things necessarily are already woven into the fabric of the present. To a Christian, faithfulness to an oath in the face of uncertainty means hope. What is at stake in my resolve to keep this oath is not myself, but my responsibility to my beloved, my responsibility to the oath I have made. At stake is my hope for our future. And I find surety the answer to my question, what's the point in that responsibility? I have loved and been loved, and I continue to love in faith and hope. The responsibility of being faithful, of continuing to love, has no end. Our erotic relationships must continually be remade. We must carry the weight of fidelity. Love may be perfect, it may be whole, but it's never finished. It goes without saying that sexual love is not the only kind of love. Love relationships can take many forms, friend and friend, teacher and student, neighbor and neighbor, husband and wife. Nevertheless, marriage is paradigmatic of all forms of love. Conjugal love gives life to flesh in two ways. The most obvious is by producing new life, and we cannot avoid recognizing the importance of that part of marriage. But just as important is that it gives me life as a human being. It gives me living flesh, making me human. Victor Frankenstein thought he could give his creature a body, but he could not put him into a human relationship. He could not give his creature flesh. So the creature remained a monster who had never had who never had more than a representation of human life. Like Adam alone in the garden, he had a body that breathed and moved, but his condition was as God, but not Frankenstein saw, not good. 
Adam's relationship to Eve gives him flesh. Other forms of love also enliven my flesh. They too give me life as a human being. They too are a matter of oath. Ultimately, love is best understood with marriage as its model. People in an erotic and fecund relationship in which Eve is faithful to his or her oath. Frankenstein's monster could not find love because he was merely an individual. He wanted to love Frankenstein, but could not. He wanted to help her to stand before him, but could not find one. He says, the fallen angel became a malignant devil, yet even that enemy of God and had friends and associates in his desolation. I am alone. Though the creature seems to have felt something like the emotion that we identify with love, he did not have a love relationship. His monstrosity was a function of his individualistic existence. And the result was tragedy, destruction for Frankenstein's friends and family, for his bride, and ultimately for both himself and his creature. For Adam and Eve, however, the story is very different. Adam's exclamation, this now is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, is presumably also Eve's. I read it also as an oath to continue to be with her. And I assume that she made the same oath, for, to quote the scripture, Adam knew Eve his wife, and she bare unto him sons and daughters, and they began to multiply and replenish the earth. Marriage embodied and erotic makes us human and is the foundation for human sociality. Thank you.